we were uh, attempting to get wages that at least closed the gap and, and you know, we're in line with the rate of inflation and we've done this uh, through this agreement. All right, let's start with those wage increases because according to the union, these are substantially higher than what had been previously disclosed. 12.6% over four years to be exact. Hi, welcome to About That. I'm Lauren Burden for Andrew Chang. So PSAC, the Public Service Alliance of Canada, the union that represents 120,000 government workers, reached an agreement with the Treasury Board of Canada recently. And it was a big deal because it was such a significant raise. We did a full breakdown of this deal on our show right when it came out. Essentially, the union representing the workers asked for 13.5%. The government initially offered nine and they settled at 12.6. And the union leader called the deal precedent setting and said that it could have significant impact on negotiations of all kinds of labor disputes. Workers are, are, are just fed up and they're frustrated. So I think you're gonna see more of that uh, labor unrest. I think you're gonna see workers taking more of these types of job action uh, to make sure that they're getting the, the working conditions and the wages that they deserve. And there are several unions that are either in negotiations or will be in the next few months. And who wouldn't want a significant raise, right? I mean, especially these days, anyone paying bills or going to the grocery store knows that money in your pocket doesn't buy what it did, even a year ago. Inflation has eaten away your purchasing power. And here's inflation over the last 10 years, fairly stable between one and 2% until you hit the pandemic years. That means that in 2012, if you went to your local grocery store and bought say $200 worth of groceries, Fast forward to 2022, that same amount of food would cost just under $240. We don't have the full numbers for 2023 yet, but we know that the number is going up. And wages on average just haven't kept up with inflation. So in real terms, every year, you're actually making less money than the year before. Here's what I mean. Like look at the rate of inflation against the average wage increases from 1950 to 1990. And this gives you some perspective. We haven't seen wages rise consistently higher than the rate of inflation since the 60s and early 70s. And since the 80s, households have been earning less than the rate of inflation. And that means that the last people to out earn inflation are probably retired or at least retirement age. So looking at that 12.6% PSAC got over four years, it's sounding even better in context. And it made us wonder, like, could this be a good time to ask for a raise? Or could a potential recession close that window? The IMF says things will get worse before they get better. You're going to be in for uh, some turbulent times economically in 2023. There is an acknowledgement that we are in a really uncertain time in the world economy. To help us sort this out, I'm going to go talk with our good friend and senior business correspondent, Peter Armstrong. Hey, Peter. Nice to see you again. Thanks for being here. All right, so um, inflation has been raging for the last year. We've It's coming down, but still it's strong. And so, you know, a bump in your paycheck is probably a really good thing right now. Not bad, for sure. Yeah, I want to uh, show you what Jonathan Weir said. He's a labor historian at George Brown College. This is a, a big victory for PSAC. This is a big victory for uh, the trade union movement in Canada. This is a big victory for workers. Um, any any significant wage gain um, in any uh, collective bargaining, especially when it comes to uh, one of the larger unions in Canada, is an important win. Um, and this, of course, will encourage workers um, to ask for more. Okay, right. 12.6 over four years. Is this a deal that other labor groups are going to be looking at to try and achieve? He's entirely right. It's going to encourage workers to ask for more. And that's great. You want workers to make more, work more, work more hours, make more money, because then they spend more money and the whole economy grows. It's good for employees. It's good for employers. The question is, will this serve as an inspiration? Sure. Is it also potentially kind of a high watermark? Possibly, right? You look at the various forces that have come together in this particular moment that allowed this deal to happen. Inflation rising. So the, you couldn't say, oh, please accept a 1.5% raise when inflation is up around 8%. Of course not. Right. Uh, at a time when employers couldn't find employees to fill the jobs they had, 
and employees were saying, hey, Lauren, I really like working for you, but the guy across the street's going to offer me 10% more, so I'm going to go there. The guy down the road is going to give me an extra week of holidays, so I'm going to go there. The power dynamic in that relationship has finally, after all these years, shifted to the employees, and that's great, and it leads to deals like this. The question is, now as the economy slows, now as inflation's coming back under control, now as the jobs market is starting to get back under control a little bit, is that same power dynamic going to exist? Maybe, or maybe this was just the high water. Right, and you mentioned there like all these years because it's been a really long time <laughs> since wages have kept up with inflation. Uh, I wanna go back to Jonathan. So really when it comes to wage increases, uh, the sort of golden era, um, is a period called the, the post-war labor settlement or the post-war labor compromise. Um, and this is a period really that begins at the end of the Second World War and lasts until the hyperinflation of the 1970s. Um, and this is a period characterized by uh, consistent wage increases um, across economies in the global north. So we haven't seen consistent wage increases since the 80s. Like, why is that? There's a bunch of reasons that sort of conspired to have that happen. One, think about that post-war post era was one of incredible innovation, of incredibly uh, huge gains in productivity, of, of massive changes in the workforce. Uh, and so as employees were getting more productive and as companies were getting more innovative, there was more money to go around. There was a, a willingness to, to, to share it. There was a demand from employees to get their fair share. Uh, and then you get into the 80s and there was a recession, then there was technological innovation, the dot-com bubble that helped one sector of the economy, but then crushed right. everybody for a little while. You go into the 2008 financial crisis. We, we've just been kind of stumbling from one crisis to the next, which is never a great time to try to claw back gains for, for employees. Uh, and then you get into this moment, which has seen inflation rise just enough. Wages never kept up, but enough that employees could make those demands. And the you know we've seen massive immigration into Canada. That's really helped with employees uh, being able to say, you know, I'm going to go across the street because there's more new jobs opening up. The economy is growing. Um, you know, so so that that last sort of however many decades of low innovation, low productivity. Uh, has really hampered workers' ability to, to get more and extract more of their negotiations. Yeah, and you talk about so many factors. I wonder how, you know, this is a huge union and how being part of a big union plays into it. And I'm just going to go back to Jonathan Weir. One of the things I think that we're really seeing, especially among younger workers, is younger workers are really seeing the benefits of unionization, especially as younger, more and more younger workers um, are being forced into low wage and often precarious work. Um, so increasingly what you're starting to see is you're starting to see younger workers taking the lead when it comes to unionization um, and unionizing workplaces that historically haven't been unionized. So do you need to be part of a union to get this kind of a raise? You don't necessarily. But look, it is always better that if you and I go to our employer together and say, hey, we want to get these concessions, it's better than me going in alone. Right. And if there's a bunch of us, it's better going in alone. But unions have had a hard time with relevancy over the last several decades, and they've been really hollowed out. Uh, and a lot of that has been the erosion of manufacturing in North America, the labor force has changed, the workforce has changed, the work they do has changed. And I think he brings up an amazing point about younger workers and more precarious work, frontline food services jobs, stuff like that, yeah. where unions have been able to go in and say, we can get a better deal for you in this instance, and have broadened out who they're trying to represent, what they're trying to accomplish, and, and what the role of the union is. And, and the unions themselves have to adapt. The world is different than it was in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, which is, again, different from it was, you know, with the big rise of the unions pre-World War II. Right. And we've been hearing, you know, that for the last year, really, that uh, there might be a looming recession on yep. the horizon. You know, there's a lot of talk about about the fact that we might be going into a recession, right? That's a distinct possibility. Um, and to a certain extent, we're being pushed into a recession, right? Um, the Bank of Canada is intervening to increase interest rates. Um, that reduces the amount of money that gets invested in the economy. Um, that, of course, uh, you know, slows economic growth and, of course, reduces uh, employment, right? So in a sense, we're being pushed into a recession in order to address uh, this perception of high levels of inflation. Um, we're, of course, going to need to get out of that recession as well. Um, and one of the best ways to get out of a recession is to ensure that workers have more money, that working people have more money, that then gets spent, gets spent on goods and services in the economy. 
uh, that then leads to further economic growth, right? So there's a, a balancing act that the Bank of Canada is, is trying to do. All right. So what do you think of what he said there? Do you need to make more to get out of a recession? Uh, yes, uh, but you've got to solve the problems in front of you. And right now, we're not in a recession. Right now, the problem is still too high inflation. So the yes, he's right that the Bank of Canada is deliberately slowing the economy and potentially pushing us into a recession. But you, it is a balancing act. He's right on that as well. And the balancing act is solve the problems in front of you first, which is inflation, deal with the next problem, which might be a recession down the road. And if inflation's back under control and the economy does go into the ditch, you can move interest rates back up or back down to try to stimulate the economy into, into, into to more growth again. Um, so it is a balancing act and it's a super tricky one. I certainly don't envy uh, the Bank of Canada in this. Absolutely. And thank you so much, Peter Armstrong. You bet. Always great to have you. Thanks.